Stop him! He's supposed to die! Nice work, Homer! Am I proud of you? Well... When you go home tonight, there's gonna be another story on your house. Thank you. Being a cartoon fan really used to mean something, bro. I'm telling you. The 2000s were what I like to call the cartoon event episode era. It wasn't a movie. It wasn't just an episode. This was a whole new vibe. And every network did these. Just endless promos, screen bugs, counting down till they drop. This shit really was the truth. So today, I'll be taking a look at five examples from five different cartoons, all shows that I have nostalgic relationships with. Episodes that I distinctly remember the night that they came out. I hope you're ready for a fistful of Ed. Oh, shit. This is Cartoon Event Episodes, Volume 1. No! You remember what happened last time? Come on, bro, stop it. Why don't you bring the Peanuts videos back? You saw that Franklin trailer, they fixed the races. <laughs> Leave me the fuck alone! This ain't televised, they telling lies, but promise I won't. We've been patronized, they taking lives, I'm on my way home. Relax my mind about half the time I'm watching cartoons, for knocks how I'm locked in my room. Of course they resemble my skin when I watch two. Hypnotizing, Titanic, how I follow through the vibes. Okay. Dreaming mama's proud as if she looks through his penny size. On a man of the house like Oscar. Slide. You deceive, I believe he the Oscar. James Earl, when I speak, I'm a fossa. Got a swerve in the streets, never block us. I go, feel more, just try to make you feel more. Through the halls, I felt scorns. Looking at me, cause I don't like what you like, you feel Feel torn, should have smacked your lights like back. You ain't seen pimping before. For the stars, I shoot pimping. No boy, you best check the score. Jimmy Neutron Rescue Jet Fusion is brought to you by Johnson's Kids Foam Blaster Shampoo, Campbell's Soup, MGM's Movie Good Boy, and Nickelodeon. I think I was pretty much around for all the Jimmy Neutron specials, low key. I even remember my aunt walking me into the theater late to see the movie. This isn't just B-roll, this is the part where we walked in. People have talked about the power hours to death, and only a select few know why I could never bring up Win Lose Kaboom, but I rarely ever see anybody talk about the big bruh, Jet Fusion. I couldn't find that many promos from that era from my brief scraping around on YouTube because I always wait till the last minute to write these videos, but I genuinely remember this being a big deal in 03. I even had the game, bruh, and not the swaggy one. I had that shit on Game Boy. Please, somebody tell me that you had this booty ass game and I could never beat it. I wasted so many hours for whatever this shit is. <laughs> Mom ain't love me, bro. Why she buy me this? It starts with this really cool spy opening sequence. A couple shows did this from time to time. Now, Kim Possible ate everybody up with soda drama, though. That shit just say Raven? Who the fuck she thought she was? Jet Fusion, voiced by Christian Slater, is the big action star that all the kids are obsessed with, and I think I kinda get it. They did a really great job making bro the right amount of annoyingly cool, just like James Bond. This whole special was just kinda like a baby James Bond adventure. Can I get you boys something to drink? Milkshakes. She can not stir up. <laughs> it's kinda funny. Like, come on, man. Die Again Tomorrow Forever is the coldest movie name. Are you shitting me? Hate to leave you hanging, but I've got a jet. Did the smoke from his boots just spell out his initials? I think I might love this nigga. That Jet Fusion movie was totally cutting edge and an out of the box in your face kind of way. Oh my gosh. Jet's catchphrase is even got a jet. Real similar to Jimmy's got a blast. And I found it kind of annoying for years. But after this watch, it kind of makes me wonder if the whole reason Jimmy even says got a blast is because of how much he idolizes Jet. The special makes it a point to show us that they always love bro. Like they weren't introduced to him in his movies in this special so maybe this is like his way of showing homage and you know what for that it's cute still kind of cringe but at least the shit cute you find out that jet fusion is not only an actor playing an agent but an actual agent he's captured by professor calamitous bro who can never finish anything like me an organization sends jimmy to go out there and save him this special is also probably the reason why i'm attracted to women with lower voices because this is where they introduce professor calamitous's daughter beautiful gorgeous she looking a little big back there. Hold on now. Why they air this on Nickelodeon? Easy, easy, big fella. <laughs> this 
This isn't right, man. We shouldn't make art for the male gaze, right, guys? Girl, what the gay niggas got to do with it? The Jimmy Neutron wiki is so fucking mean to her. What the hell? Beautiful Gorgeous's appearance is exactly what her name suggests. Extremely attractive and sexy, though only by Jimmy Neutron standards. Excuse me? What the fuck this cartoon do to you? <laughs> These little niggas spend so much time talking about how much they love this white lady. It is ridiculous. It just escalates. It gets worse and worse. Are you boys all right? Will you be my mommy? That, oh. I don't, uh, I don't think I have the video essay analysis skills to try to figure out what exactly this is saying um, about Carl. Uh, excuse me, Mrs. Gorgeous. Don't we get a last request? Oh, oh yeah. How about a quick game of spin the bottom? Okay, when she gets out of jail, I get to marry her. Maybe I'll be jealous, but as a poet says, <clears throat> the heart wants what the heart wants. Nah, -uh, she like me best because I'm built for comfort and not for speed. <laughs> what the fuck does that even mean, bro? I feel like I'm losing my mind. The professor and beautiful gorgeous are so much fun together. They have this this really silly bickering father daughter dynamic. I don't know how old she's supposed to be, but when she's yelling at him, she just kind of sounds like a bratty nineteen year old. How on earth did they escape? Well, let's see. The kid's got an IQ of two ten, and the other one's a top spy. Oh, I wonder. Don't you take that tone of voice with me, young lady? I'm over eighteen. I can do what I want. You're not the boss of me. You mind your father for once. After them. And they give her this running gag where she clearly did not want to be a villain and wanted to do something else growing up, but they just won't let her say what it is. Tell us, Gorgeous, what did you want to be instead of a villainess? I might as well tell you since you're about to be eliminated. I always wanted to be a... If you'd let me do what I wanted with my life, we wouldn't be rolling down Mount Everest in a giant snowball. Are you talking about your silly childhood dream? I will give it up! No, I won't give it up! I want to be a... I never wanted this life of crime. Do you know what I really wanted to be? No, and I don't care. It probably ain't even that deep. She probably just wanted to be a board artist or something. I always thought the animation on Jimmy Neutron still kind of held up pretty well. It still looks good for an era where some of the best looking stuff was like Ice Age. This isn't just B-roll again. This is the part where I walked into the theater. And it was the same aunt too. Some of this shit is still pretty laughable, especially some of the fight scenes. I don't got the nostalgia goggles on that tight now. What did you say, Aunt Selma? I said take off those damn glasses. It's still stylized, it's fluent, it has its own charm. It always struck me as a cartoon that knew its limitations. So it used the wonkiness of some of the models to just make the characters even funnier. I think the thing that I always really liked about Jimmy Neutron is that it really is just all about subversions. The kid with the lab hidden in his house is honest to his parents about it. The kid with the dumb sidekicks isn't slapping or bossing them around, he treats them like equals. In Rescue Jet Fusion, when Jet is understandably upset that they sent a kid to save him, I feel like it's so easy to get Jimmy that I'll show you mindset but nah he doesn't they just kind of start working together organically all right there's your jet fusion analysis I got like four more cartoons to talk about <laughs> I fuck with jet fusion but it's Jimmy Neutron so of course I do it's still one of my favorite kids shows from that era the characters are fun the action is kind of cool it's funny as fuck y'all saw the clips I was playing this thing was cracking my shit up I had to stop myself from writing down every funny line this franchise is one of the last big like kids rock shows and after rewatching stuff like jet fusion it really puts you right back into that headspace still not watching win lose kaboom though mm -mm. nope goodbye professor calamitous oh shit jimmy put that shit down homie you not paru real quick today's video is actually brought to you by nordvpn hi i'm toon rific tariq appearing on camera because you know nordvpn you're watching cartoon video essays on YouTube. Of course you know what NordVPN is. But do you know NordVPN.com slash Toonrific Tariq? You ever like jump on public Wi-Fi and somebody just jack all your information? You get a Facebook message from a fifth grade teacher that you haven't thought about in at least 10 years with a link like, oh my God, oh, I got this embarrassing picture of you, look. Only for it to be malware and they jack your stuff. You think I want this? It just happened. Well, that's why. You gotta jump on that NordVPN.com slash Toonrific Tariq, bruh. A VPN protects all your information when you're online. Data, location, search history, and that's definitely what NordVPN does. Feel safe and protected wherever you at. Every purchase of a two-year plan will receive four bonus months on top if you click the link in my bio. And that includes all plans. Standard, plus, complete, as well as a three-month coupon to share with a friend or to use personally, which would extend the subscription to 31 months. Everybody safe, everybody eating, 30-day 
money back guarantee. Oh man! Safety first, homie. Get an exclusive NordVPN deal today using my link in the description. That's nordvpn.com slash tunerificktariq. T-O-O-N-R-I-F-I-C-T-A-R-I-Q. This April, the ultimate Ed, Ed, and Eddie marathon is coming to Cartoon Network. More than 100 episodes and over 30 hours of one of Cartoon Network's longest-running series. And it all leads up to one final adventure. The last episode of Ed, Ed, and Eddie. It's a day that will change television forever. The best day ever continues all day, today and tomorrow. Naughty, but you like it, nasty, but you want it. I'm the chick that never fronted. By 2007, all of the other cartoon cartoons were gone and Billy and Mandy was on his way out too. And I don't remember the end of any of those even being like a big deal. Friday would come around and suddenly, there wasn't a new Time Squad. There wasn't a new Sheep in a Big City. There wasn't a new Mike Lou and Og. <laughs> Why am I picking these examples? I think Cartoon Network knew exactly what they had with Ed, Ed and Eddie. So they let them actually go out with a bang. I remember being at my grandma's house, seeing a commercial for something called The Best Day Edder. 30 hour marathon where they'd even skip Adult Swim so they could air every single episode of Ed, Ed and Eddie in order leading up to A Fistful of Ed, the final episode. Heavy quotation marks on that. I don't think I made it clear in that video I did a while back about the theme song. This cartoon is in my fucking DNA. I used to love this shit more than some of my family members. Fam, I still get chills from that part in the promo where Buddy says the last episode. Those emotions are baked into my core at this point. I felt like I was gonna throw up for like two days. I miss when cartoons used to make me feel like that. Now only cartoon fans make me feel like that. The Cartoon Network Wiki actually has the episode listing by time so you can see when everything aired. Fam, Duel and Ed's came on at midnight? That's the fish one, bro. Y'all know that one. I know I was hot. My mother used to make me go to bed at like 10. And my dirty ass would actually go to bed. I was not cool like y'all. Cartoon Network would later go on to release what they branded as the lost episodes of Ed, Ed and Eddie and chase that with their movie, Ed, Ed and Eddie's Big Picture show in 2009, technically making it the longest running of the cartoon cartoons. A Fistful of Ed is about Double D getting caught in these misunderstandings that lead the whole school to think that he's just some kind of thug that beats everybody up, and they are terrified of this nigga. Don't shoot, don't. You can't! He's watching! Hey, no bullshit? He fucked Ralph up! <laughs> No lie, I would have shit myself and begged my mom to change zip codes. Look at this poor man. Why do you have a spare writing stick? Rolls has been reduced to that at the size of a baby's bazoo. You can just say that? You can't just say that, right? They do a good job too hiding from us what's really going on. So we almost believe the fears that the other kids have. Then in the second act, they go in and play these events out as they actually happen. I always thought this was a cool way to do this. Remembering mother had packed my lunch with a slice of her heavenly apple crumble pie, I thought the best thing to compose this conflict would be to share it. Ah, fuck. Ah, I hate that part. This episode gives all the Eds something to do, not just Double D. Ed is really struggling with the fact that his wholesome friend, the one that he could turn to to feel loved, is suddenly doing the opposite to everyone around him. It puts a wedge between them that's then emphasized in that great moment where Ed jumps in front of Sarah to protect her. And Eddie's just high key using it for clout. I ain't gonna hold you. This nigga is a damn menace, just sick. Right, you know best champ. So hey, I'm gonna go make Naz rub my feet. Make? Did I hear that right? Did that nigga just say make? Hey, you know they got your mans. They got your mans on sex assault charges. <laughs> the nigga you be hanging with. The nigga you be hanging with, nigga. In the second half, Jimmy steps in after hearing Double D's side and tries to stage a fight, but Eddie's arrogance just fucks everything up. This shit is just a mess now. <laughs> Resulting in Jimmy beating up Eddie and Double D. This nigga ain't even do nothing, man. I feel so bad. He bit this nigga tongue off? Who is raising these children? The longer the show went on, the more expressive these characters became. And since this is the end, there's no doubt it peaks here with some really great character work. The argument with Double D and Ed is so rough. The voice acting and character animation really mold this cartoon into something I've never seen before. Look how this fucking breaks them. Listen to the sound design when Double D realizes that he lost his friend. My mom says I can't be! 
He jumps with a pretty face because like you. This is like a master class shit. This is the type of shit that needs to be studied. It's me and Johnny Two Cellos, by the way. This is why y'all ain't getting no new episodes of the podcast. I feel like there's definitely moments. No, 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 that was a joke. We're still best friends. The pod is coming back in April. I feel like there's definitely moments in this thing that kind of feel like a finale. But even as a kid, I couldn't help shaking the fact that this kind of just felt like an episode. As a kid, right, I kept saying that this needed a moment of truth, which I think was my way of saying that I expected the characters' true feelings about each other to come out. I expected some sort of thematic closure. The closest you get to that is Eddie telling the cankers to fuck off, but that's really it. If that's what you're looking for today though, the movie definitely has you covered. Even though it ends with them beating up the one black kid while he has a watermelon on his head. Huh, that's funny. I didn't know Johnny was black. Hey guys, did you know that Johnny was black? I will rip your fucking arms off. You better not call me that shit. Bad enough I still get it under one video even five years later. I hate to get the shit under an actual good one. The first episode ends with them chasing jawbreakers and the last episode ends with them eating glizzards. Ain't that just the American way? Fuck, the show's Canadian. I, fuck. I'll admit, in the grand scheme of things, A Fistful of Ed isn't really anything special. It's just a pretty good episode of Ed, Ed, and Eddie. It doesn't recontextualize the show or anything like that. It doesn't really add anything or take anything away from the franchise. But at the same time, it's still funny. It's a little heartbreaking and sweet. I think the idea of it and the atmosphere around it when it aired is what I'm more infatuated with today. But that doesn't mean it's still not a good time, because it is. It just takes you back to a simpler time when the most you had to worry about is your favorite cartoon coming to an end. Now you gotta worry about every cartoon ending. Eddie, I thought that was my hot dog. Thank you, Eddie. Oh. There! Is everybody happy? Good! Gee. You ain't feel bad at all? Like, no guilt? Mommy Chucky feeling Lil and Susie. <laughs> They forgot Angelica. Rugrats was created by the studio class Kisupo, which did the animation on early Simpsons, shit like Rocket Power, Duckman, Real Monsters. <laughs> Among other things that pay my bills through college, but Rugrats was and still is their most popular. The first movie was the first non-Disney animated movie to gross over $100 million. So popular that they made two more theatrical films. One with so much emotional weight that people are still talking about it in their 30s, and the other one that gets shit on a lot, but man, is this thing pretty. Like, look at some of this shit. These niggas got a star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame, 14 years, two spinoffs. Rugrats was inescapable for years. For the 10th anniversary, we got all grown up not to be confused with all grown up a double lame special episode that shows the babies 10 years older as if they aged in real time from when the show came out in 91 which in today's math would make them almost old enough for diapers again nice this is from july 2001 i'm not even sure how I'm even able to remember this for real. Nigga can't even remember what he had for lunch yesterday, but I mean, I still remember 9-11 too, so I don't know, my nigga. I can't tell you much about the energy at the time or the promos or anything like that. I just know I remember seeing it when it aired. Tommy, Chucky, Phil, Lil, Dill, and Kimmy fight Angelica over her toy karaoke machine, and it's just Tommy's last fucking straw. Hey, man, I know this was a different time, but golly, is this thing taking its time. I forgot I was even watching this special. That's how long this thing took. Only thing that reminded me was me asking myself, why else would I be watching the Rugrats episodes with Kimmy in them? Shit taking longer to start than a Toonrific Tariq video. It's really only seven minutes, I just wanted to make a couple jokes. The babies, after watching a futuristic time traveling movie on cable and getting locked in a closet by Angelica, decide that they're going to go to the future, where they're too old for Angelica to push them around. And that's where you meet the older versions of everybody. The fact that they all show up one by one is such a great choice already, but it's a real testament to how well-rounded these characters are, that they're able to make them all step out and even 
immediately show their established connections and personalities through short dialogue. Angelica opens the door, judging everybody just like she always does. Tommy comes out continuing his argument with her while also sticking up for everyone else. Chucky backs Tommy up, Phil comes out with a silly quip. Lil comes out yelling at Phil, even starting with her signature Philip. I gotta use one of those, man, fuck. Dill not only comes out last since he's the youngest, but he throws something at Angelica, which is not only in the cartoon a lot, but it's also set up in the first act. Someday, Drooly, you're gonna throw something at me and I'm not gonna be nice about it no more. Yeah, he throws a Reptar. Not only is Reptar deeply tied to the show, but when Dill was born in the first movie, he spent most of his time in that Reptar wagon when they were lost in the woods. That's cute. <laughs> look how thoughtful this little ugly cartoon is. And look. Here go Kimmy. I think I ripped my pants. Nigga. <laughs> Come on, bro. That ain't right. Kimmy is so washed, they stole her intro line from a completely different mix. <laughs> Shit, crazy. Niggas really don't give a fuck about me, man. They try to maintain the character's iconic outfits in most of these designs, and I really like how some of these translate, especially Angelica and Phil. Hey, my man Phil put that shit on, okay? Tommy Def got the worst fit, though. No bullshit. I see what they was trying to take us with the little baby blue baseball shirt, the royal blue jeans with the low-down dirty shames on the bottom. <laughs> man, no. <laughs> What the hell is this, nigga? I will take you to the mall. Even just beyond the babies, right? It's just really cool to see how everyone else in this world ages up. Susie's the best, man. I love Susie. It's great that they have her come in during the second half as Tommy's babysitter. Still maintaining that she's the most trusted and responsible out of all the kids. And this short hair design they gave her is the truth. I like that they kept the Rugrats pattern on her shirt, but still let her switch her palette up. It was definitely the right decision. Ah, right, here she go. Sipping that grape drink, what the? Oh no, man, these niggas going to hell, nephew, fuck. I guess they felt like they didn't age Charlotte up enough because check shorty and all grown up, looking like damn Joan Rivers. They all do a great job making these kids sound older too. Shout out to the whole voice cast. Tommy and Chucky have those shaky, awkward, finna hit puberty uh, kind of quality to their voices. Angelica's definitely in a lower register. Dill's just Ben 10 low key. And Phil kind of already had like a dude voice <laughs> as a baby, so Cap Susie didn't even really have to do anything. I love that the kids are just as nostalgic for Rugrats as we are at this point, especially Phil. Remember when we always used to sit in the sandbox when we were bummed out? Yeah, sandbox? How could I have forsaken ye? Yeah, we had a lot of good times in this year, dirt. Tomorrow we're officially practically teenagers. We're going to our first concert. Yeah, unless you count those baby concerts where they gave out juice and made us quack. <sighs> Anybody else miss those sippy cups? I'm just, just checking. Yeah, that stuff looks like worms. That's it. Come on, Lil. <laughs> <laughs> Where are they going? Stu is getting ready for a disco competition. I don't remember you wearing that, Daddy. That's because someone dropped him on his head when he was a baby. Dill's fine. We only dropped him once. <laughs> Meanwhile, the kids are hyping up an Emika concert that's happening across the street. Angelica lies to her homegirls, saying that she has the same chain as Emika, when it's really just Stu's lucky chain that he uses for all his disco shit. Angelica pulls up on Tommy and tries to... Why am I explaining this? There's a subplot where Chucky has a crush on Angelica's homegirl, Samantha. And it gives us a great look at how Tommy is there for him when they're older, right? He puts his father's chain in jeopardy, something that's really important to him, just so Angelica could put him on. It's also, I think, a uh, great evolution of the Chucky confidence stories, which is something that happened a lot in the cartoon. It's even in one of the movies. I usually roll my eyes at these kind of plots, but Chucky's too sincere, man. I, I can't do it. Now I remember. Braces. The worst. How long are you in for? 2.5 years. See, sometimes after they tighten them. Bruh, close your mouth. <laughs> Never mind, this nigga Chucky got me mad as fuck. What a phony. Uh, huh? Tommy? is also a cool in the gang sample but i'd rather transition with the song that i already have on my computer a lot happens that wouldn't make the video any fun if i just recapped but tommy angelica and dill throws through his chain over this fake ass another one bites the dust beat and this thing is start wilding yes i 
I like that Stu isn't doing these elaborate, big, cartoony dances. It's just kind of an old guy trying to do whatever won't make his back go out. This knee shit, though, this shit go crazy. This nigga got knees like Meg Thee Stallion. The kids make it to the concert. Tommy and Angelica get called on stage to sing with the star. Let's see. What about that cool guy next to the dude in the bracelet? Cool guy? Do you not see this fit? Man, <laughs> you wanna talk about nostalgia? <laughs> Nothing really does it for me more than Emika's song. This shit tickles the side of my brain with Mr. Rogers in it. You were there for me, I'm there for you. Wherever I go, I know this is true. They got this nice little montage during the song where it's just all these clips from all over the show, really making it feel like this really big anniversary celebration of the cartoon. It's probably one of the reasons my videos end the way they do. Or this is just a cover up for me ripping off Rebel Taxi. I'll never tell. Okay. <laughs> one last thing about this special. I have a question. It starts with the babies watching a time travel movie, which prompts them to understand the concept of what the future is and them wanting to go there to get away from Angelica. I'm tired of Angelica always bossing us around, getting us in trouble and making us do stuff we don't want to do. She treats us like we were a bunch of babies. Oh wait, because they are babies, I get it. Which, you know, is a clever thing to do narratively. But see now, here is my question. Did any of this actually fucking happen? Is this really just us getting a glimpse of what the babies will be like in 10 years? Or is this their imagination imagining what they'll be like in 10 years? The episode even ends with a transition of Tommy and Angelica fighting over the mic as preteens. This is very purposefully mending both timelines together. And right, okay, even if you're screaming, yes, they're obviously playing at your phone, TV, laptop, Zoom, whatever y'all watching this shit on. What the fuck is all grown up then? Is it just them playing this future game for four seasons? I mean, the designs are pretty similar, save for some of the adults who, let's face it, definitely needed a redesign anyway. Emika, who is not a thing in Rugrats, is invented for this special. And while she doesn't appear in All Grown Up, she is definitely referenced. So are we to believe that the babies imagined everything right in this special. They just all correctly guessed their future. Is this even Angelica's fucking karaoke machine? Why does this shit look like Susie? When the fuck did they drop Dill? I don't know, nigga, I don't really care. This is just kind of theatrics. They made this for six year olds, not 26 year olds. Adults need to put their brain power elsewhere. Uh, at this point. All Grown Up is still fun as shit. It's really sweet. This thing breaks all the nostalgic scales. It's exactly the kind of episode that makes you want to go back and watch all of Rugrats. Then you remember that the show ran for 10 years. Then you remember that you're on your third rewatch of The Office and nothing matters anymore, I guess. <laughs> They can't make movies anymore, right? They have no more money. Like, like. <laughs> it's the biggest thing to happen in 10,000 years. It's an event of massive proportions. And it's tiny. Here, this is the first fairy baby born in thousands of years. Yeah. Now let's see if you're a boy or a girl. Yeah. Got that new baby smell? Uh. Meet the newest member of the Fairly Odd family in a brand new movie, Fairly Odd Baby, due Monday, February 18th at 8, only on Nick. Right, the baby one. A lot of discussion in current day about Fairly Odd Parents is more about what the show later became or what it's currently turning into. But coming from someone who watched a lot of Nickelodeon growing up, this shit really was everywhere. Butch be cutting up now, but he high key had the streets. Like he ain't never lied. Between Fairly Odd Parents, Danny Phantom, Tough Puppy, don't even get me started on Tough Puppy. No, really don't get me started because I wouldn't have shit to say. That was mean. I like Tough Puppy. I feel like bro and his art style was just some shit you couldn't get away from for a while. Like Classy Supo, obviously to a lesser degree. After Philly Odd Parents' first cancellation in 2006, the show returned two years later with the special Fairly Odd Baby, introducing Cosmo and Wanda's son, Poof. Which Butch Hartman says he always wanted to do, but people online theorized for years that it was some sort of scrappy do rating shit. Which, to be fair, if that is true, 
definitely worked. This special is still one of Nick's biggest hits and because of it, this show ran until I was in college. I was 10 when this came out. Why the fuck does this work on kids? If I had the time, this is where I put a little skit of me adding a younger character to my videos to boost ratings, but I keep writing these things at the last minute. This is a very odd fuck. Fuck, I didn't write that on purpose. This is a very odd, specific thing to remember. And I'm probably showing my age a little bit with this, but I remember that before this came out, my homeboy, he had Optimum Cable. And his cable box had a, like a like a preview of this episode on Free On Demand. And no, not the Phineas Honey Turkey homeboy, a different homeboy. Oh, wait, y'all didn't get to that part of the video yet. That is going to be so funny in like 10 minutes. Cosmo and Wanda are really depressed because they want to have a baby. <laughs> Don't say the B word! What, bitch? Fuck you, don't tell me what to do. Timmy just wishes for them to have a baby, since there's nothing in the rules that says that he can't. Um, no wishing yourself into a theory, no wishing someone back to life, no Tom Cruise, damn it! Theories actually stopped having babies like thousands of years ago, so this is a really big deal. It's a beautiful sunshiny day! It makes me wanna sing! La 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 la! Why did you do this to me? Look at me! I'm fat! <laughs> Timmy and Cosmo fall out beefing because Cosmo is the absolute worst when he's pregnant. Oh, right, I forgot to say that Cosmo's the pregnant one. I'm sick of this whole baby wish! I wish Cosmo would just get lost! Oh, thank God, fam, you don't even want to know what I thought he was about to wish for. When the baby's finally born, everybody tries to take him away because fairy baby magic powers are unstable and they all want to use it for their advantage. Jorgen, anti-Cosmo, Method Man and Red Man. I was kind of wondering why anti-Cosmo isn't pregnant too, especially since we end up getting Foop later on, but I guess it's not like us. They aren't necessarily tethered together. I don't I don't remember the lore anymore. I'll be having sex now. He's, He's lying. lying. He's, He's lying. lying. But also this is a frame from one of the last episodes of this show. Yeah, so I I'm not even gonna bother trying to make sense of any of this goofy shit. Most of this is kind of just a bunch of running around, running around to find Cosmo, hide poof, find poof, which isn't a bad thing in terms of like objective quality. But man, I really forgot about all of this shit. It's one of those stories where everywhere you turn, there's like a new obstacle. Darren Norris really low key is a monster in the booth. I knew he was Cosmo and Timmy's dad, which are already two really distinct voices, but I don't think I knew he was Jorgen too. That burrito went right through me. I must now file a report with the great white round one. Dude, same, I stay shitting bro. Look how easy it is to make kids laugh because why was them trying to check if the baby was a boy or a girl the funniest shit ever to me when I was 10? Excellent question. Let me just take it outside where the light is better and find out. Uh... It would be easier to name it if we knew what it was. Let me just check. Well, it would be easier to name if we knew what it was. Let me just check. What a strange gag to keep repeating. Why my mom even let me watch this freak ball shit? Actually, never mind. The year after this, we saw the Biggie movie in theaters. Now let's see if you're a boy or a girl. Yeah. New baby smell. Yeah. Ah, no. no, 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 you imbecile. That's not talc. That's paprika. Ah, take that. It's a boy because boys love water squirters. <laughs> Whatever, bro. I don't know, man. I've seen other Fairly Odd Parent episodes recently that made me laugh a lot, but I wasn't really feeling this one this time around. I know I said that it being a bunch of running around isn't an objective issue, and it isn't. I just don't think it's for me. To me, sometimes it feels a little bit aimless, constantly trying to move characters in different directions to keep things interesting, to keep things going. And I'm not really a big fan of the day being saved by Poof ripping ass. Smell that? Fairly Odd Baby is cool, I guess. It's definitely nostalgic since I remember Poof being such a big deal at the time, but I think it's my least favorite out of all of the specials in this video. You can tell by how short this segment is compared to everything else, and I'm not just saying that because I wrote it last. I legitimately thought I was gonna have so much to talk about with like Timmy and his connection to Poof or something, but nah. I'm tapped out. This, this is, is all, all I, I got. got. Watch these videos instead. I didn't even use the FaceTime sound effect in this one. There it is. No, I won't stop using it. I don't care that you think your girl hung up on you. Stop watching my videos on fucking FaceTime and maybe you won't have these problems.
<laughs> Let me put y'all on Monkey Wrench real quick. Today's indie animation highlight is Monkey Wrench, created by... Man, I love that sound effect. Monkey Wrench follows two space mercenaries and their missions. Beautifully animated, extremely funny, heartwarming, bold, beautifully animated. Oh, fuck. Fuck, I'm drooling, sorry. Every time a new episode of this drops, I think about it for at least a month. The characters are so likable. It's really cool to see the two main characters slowly develop a closer bond over time. The voice work for both of them is top notch too. Shrike cracks my shit up practically every time he speaks. And I love this little cartoon he watches in the third episode. <laughs> You can find Monkey Wrench on YouTube on Newgrounds, both linked below. Just share it around, put your friends on, let everybody know this is super high quality and it's here to stay. It's definitely the coldest thing online right now. and Burb race against time. Can they circle the globe to bring you the longest day ever? Find out in Summer Belongs to You, the longest episode ever. A special one-hour event, Friday, August 6th at 8, 7 central on Disney Channel. Bitch, Summer Belongs to You? Fuck you. If you've been watching these videos for a while, you know that I used to straight love this Phineas and Ferb shit. The shit I probably still would if they stopped fucking making it. I know I talked about this one a lot in the uh, video I did with the Wacky Deli, where we interviewed Robert Hughes, the director of this special. And I really don't want to repeat myself too much, but I couldn't see myself making a video on cartoon event episodes without bringing this one up. I remember this one vividly. I saw it at my homeboy house and everything. You got two niggas in the heart of North New Jersey with two honey turkey and cheeses and cartoons? Fucking forget about it. Are you shitting me? Summer Belongs to You is about Phineas and Ferb reflecting on their summer. Our vacation is more than halfway over. And what have we accomplished? This scared the shit out of me as a kid. Cause like, fuck he mean more than halfway over. This was like season two. We just got this Phineas shit. I thought they was trying to tell us something. Little did I know at 12 that they'd uh, still be making this shit while I'm paying off student loans. Today is the summer solstice, the longest day of the year. And Ferb and I are gonna make it even longer. So you built the Statue of Liberty? No. Oh wow, that is weird. Behold! <laughs> Got y'all niggas. It turns out that today is the summer solstice, the longest day of the year. So Phineas and Ferb plan to take a trip around the world before sundown. Buford says it can't be done, so they make a bet, and if Phineas and Ferb lose, they can't do shit for the rest of the summer. The choice? To have Clay Aiken and Shaka Khan come in as stunt singers for Phineas and Ferb in this scene will never not be hilarious to me. Like, what the fuck even is this cartoon? Also, Shaka Khan, until the room collapse. Or at least that's the plan. Phineas and Ferb really is a relic of a bygone era because this might be the very last second in history where you could get off the, uh, the cartoon characters traveling all over the world and experiencing generalizations of other cultures with people just kind of leaving it alone since it's just a little silly kids cartoon. Fam. This anime shit killed me the first time I saw this. Me and my homeboy could not stop laughing. They don't even speak. They just get right into it. Like, slow down. Oh shit, Phineas and Ferb here. Time to do the sweetest dance. I don't know if any of this is culturally insensitive. A lot of this shit just ain't in my wheelhouse. So I'ma just shut my fat ass up. Wake me up if they start drinking grape soda or something. There's a part in this where they end up in Paris and Phineas and Isabella both walk around together. I'm gonna go see if I can't find some parts. Isabella, you wanna come with me? Yes! Yeah, sure, you know, whatever. It's all good, bro. Then Isabella sings this sad ass song about how he ain't showing no love. I get that Isabella wants to spend time with Phineas and everything, but like, twin, he has to fix the plane. Y'all are stranded in Paris if you don't get a fucking grip. Oh, that's too bad. I thought, you know, the two of you, a boy, a girl, alone in the city of love. <laughs> Isabella, Isabella, are you okay? Peachy. It seems so early to do this since it's only the second season, but the whole thing really does feel like a love letter to the show at that point. In the morals that it pushes through its two main characters' personalities, who I always secretly felt like were Phineas and Candace. There's so many references to things that happened throughout the whole summer events and other episodes. There's two direct scenes where someone reminds one of the characters who they are and what they've shown that they're capable of. When we did all those things, you were right there with us. I was, wasn't I? Yes, you're Candace Flynn. 
monster truck driver, charioteer, queen of Mars. I don't think I've ever thought about how great of a moment this is too much, but it really is nice. Candace and even us as the audience sees her summer so far as just a string of failures because she can't bust Phineas and Ferb. But it's so much more than that for real. A lot of the things that Phineas and Ferb did and Candace getting caught in them, it shows her resilience. It shows that she's so much more than just her comedic failures. And it's cool that Phineas and Ferb are the ones who remind her of who she is because if it wasn't for all of the stuff that they get into she wouldn't even know any of this about herself it's a great way to recontextualize the show at this point you're right i'm candace flynn lifeguard that's right candace time traveler don't break the engine i am candace flynn coup de crayon fuck i'm taking notes while smoking and i just remember that she doesn't have ears i always really love that moment in this where finney is just like he just fucking breaks vincent martella is acting his damn ass off go on greg i see you we, we could uh, we, we, we could dig a tunnel under the ocean, and then we could, uh, we could, we can, we can, we, we can't. I can, I can't believe there's nothing we can do to get off of this. <sighs> and it's great that Isabella is the one to get him out of this headspace, despite her feeling so discouraged. That's it, Isabella, you're the best. Ah, oh, dude, what? Oh, fuck. I am so fucking cringe. How did this just remind me that this frame used to be my lock screen on my Galaxy tablet? Venus and Ferb are so gleefully optimistic, cheery characters that even a damn bully can't hate. There's nothing I've ever seen that would make me believe you could pull this off. Except for that time machine thing and, oh, and the roller coaster. But other than that, nothing. Oh, and the time you played that song when the platypus came back, oh. Man, nature just bends to your will, judging it. A lot of people reminisce over the music when it comes to Phineas and Ferb, and this special is definitely no different. This is probably one of the best soundtracks, but I think sometimes it's lost just how fucking funny this cartoon could be. These are great gags, man. I was in this house rolling. <laughs> Sounds like you're flooding. I'm not flooding it. There's only 58 seconds till sundown. What kind of watch is that? Okay, I'm here. What did you want to tell me? Backyard now. Excuse me? Backyard now, please. Ferb, did you get that giant map packed? Wow, mad folding skills. <laughs> Shut up, nigga. Fuck. The colors in this thing really help it feel big, too. The early morning stuff at the house, the sun gradually setting throughout the third act, almost causing this sense of dread over the characters like they're not going to make it. You can definitely tell in some shots that this was made during the HD full by three transition period. But it's cool to see what they did to try to tap in and make this feel bigger than the show. Summer Belongs to You is still dope as hell. I don't see a reality where I don't love this thing to pieces. It was the start of a long tradition. There's one right there. Phineas, I'm not gonna get on a silly little tricycle. Candace, we're in a hurry. Just get on the trike There's and we'll no go. way I Get on the trike. This must be a special episode. He's yelling at his sister again. Phineas and Ferb was on the back half of an era that kind of lives on in stuff like Craig of the Creek, where a lot of cartoons just kind of tried to encourage kids to do shit, to make shit happen, to believe in themselves. Kids Next Door, Recess, that kind of stuff. I'm not gonna sit here and act like Phineas and Ferb got me to believe in myself as a kid or anything like that. But it definitely served as a good example of what could happen when you do. Hey, where's Perry? Would you like your with or without fromage? Honey got some boobies like pow, pow, pow. Penny X. We're streaming and everything, taking up so much of our daily lives. Sometimes I think it's easy to forget how incredible appointment TV used to be. The art of promos, screen bugs that build up to something special. And while we might never get that era back, I'm at least glad that we got to grow up in it. And I'm glad I'll always remember it. You know, I don't usually like to end these with like call to actions, but I really do want to know, what are you guys' experience with these specials? What other specials that I didn't talk about in this video give you guys these same emotions? And uh, did you like this form? Format. It was honestly a lot of fun. I hadn't had this much fun in a while. I wouldn't mind doing more stuff like this. Maybe a video on like crossovers or TV movies, other specials that I didn't talk about here. There's like a ton of stuff that I wanted to add into this video too. I just didn't have the time. Like newer stuff like Jailbreak or Not What He Seems. But maybe I could do that next time. I'm open to suggestions. Just don't suggest cartoons that I told y'all I ain't never watched. I can't give y'all 
a nostalgic take if the shit not nostalgic to me. Don't suggest no Avatar shit and get mad when I tell y'all I don't know which one of them niggas move rocks. That's what that cartoon's about, right? You're a friend to me, I'm a friend to you. When we have each other, there's nothing we can do. You were there for me, I am there for you. Wherever I go, I know this is true. Ah, oh, forget about it. We're cousins, stuck with each other for all eternity. We are friends no more! We! How about I just wish us up a baby? That's easy for you, Phineas. Summer belongs to you. It belongs to everyone. Actually, I don't say it when I'm being a real spy. Oh, please! Got a jet! You're a friend to me. I'm a friend to you. You brighten up my day. When I'm feeling blue, you are there for me. I am there for you. Whether good or bad times, we'll see it through. You're a friend to me. I'm a friend to you When we have each other There's nothing we can do Wag up When we have each other There's Hey! Give me hey. that! Angelica! Tommy. What are you doing? Give me hey. a Hey Angelica stop that! Can it pickles? Come on! Now! Boy Angelica! Hey.